and let me introduce you to the people who have not been in his class. This is Hans Ulrich Obrist, actually really a Swiss guy, I, I think, you know, the only one we have in our program so far. And he is, but he's severe, still a young man, but international recognized. So every one of our other professors seem to know him. Don't know if it's good or bad, but it is obviously the case. So let's hope he deserves his reputation and give him thanks. Actually, as uh, uh, some of you already know, we are doing this uh, seminar here in SASFE together uh, with uh, Philippe Pareno. Um, and I was invited actually uh, uh, to, um, to lecture here, to, to do a seminar here. It was from the beginning the idea to involve artists. And so um, uh, we actually decided to do the seminar in two parts, to do one part here in SASFE and the second part during the art fair in Basel, because we have the opportunity of actually many artists visiting Basel. So um, we have actually Philippe Areno, the artist from uh, Paris, who is uh, here today um, with us. And we will have in Basel the presence of Olafur Eliasson, the artist based in Berlin, as well as Anton Vidocle, uh, who is a Russian artist based in New York, who has a double practice. So he founded uh, this uh, online forum eFlux, which many of you, I suppose, might know from uh, their announcements, but also from their online uh, exhibition. So Anton will present this double practice of on the one hand having set up eFlux and on the other hand this um, artistic practice, but all of that in, uh, in Basel. Here in South Fe, we have basically decided to do the seminar in sort of different chapters. So it started this morning with um, um, a class actually where I interviewed, uh, uh, made a very long interview with uh, Philippe Pareno, uh, opening it obviously to our students who had questions to, um, uh, to Pareno. Um, and then maybe <clears throat> I should explain a little bit that sort of principle of the, uh, of the interview. Because sort of my main work as a curator um, is uh, to actually curate museum exhibitions. So I'm based at the Musée d'Amagande de la Ville de Paris, the Museum of Modern Art of the City of Paris. Besides that, I organize very regularly international biennales. So um, at the moment, preparing the Biennale of Moscow, the first Biennale of Moscow, which will start in January uh, next year. And then in 2005, the uh, Canton Triennale in Canton in, uh, uh, in China. What is basically at the origin, you know, at the point of departure, one can say, of all my exhibitions ever since the early 90s, are conversations. It's kind of an infinite conversation with artists, architects, scientists, philosophers, out of which the sort of necessity of exhibitions is born. So um, for that very reason, um, uh, obviously uh, explains that sort of project of interviews. So since the early 90s, I've been recording a lot of uh, interviews. There are kind of working discussions, one can say. Uh, 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 discussions very often by preparing a show, or by defining a show. And those sort of <coughs> uh, interviews are now gathered in books. So first volume has been, uh, has been published. So that somehow explains why I thought it could be interesting to do a kind of a new chapter of such an interview here in SASFE, which um, uh, is actually a continuation of many interviews with Philippe Pareno, because what one has to say is that those interviews are not um, journalistic, so kind of like once they're done, they're not done in the sense of that um, I've been very inspired from the beginning by interviews such as David Sylvester did them with Francis Bacon or Pierre Gabin did them with Marcel Duchamp. These are very, very long conversations, often with the same artists. Often there is a break of many months and then one catches up again. And the interview with Pareno is of that kind of sort, so it's a very regular conversation to which kind of we added a new chapter catching up with all the projects Pareno is working on at the moment. We continued a second chapter um, upon the suggestion of Philippe Pareno, we were looking for snow. So uh, it was actually a gathering around the field of snow. It's Pareno's project to actually do that kind of last sad snowman on Kilimanjaro, uh, where eternal snow is melting little by little. So uh, within the next 18 months there will be no more eternal snow on Kilimanjaro. So it was kind of a sketch for that and the discussion um, on, on that project. And in a third part we actually then uh, inverted the situation and Philip and I were uh, interviewing the uh, participants and students of, uh, um, of our class um, and sort of uh, um, uh, that is still not completely finished so that sort of third chapter will then continue later tonight after the lecture and uh, also in uh, Basel. Now <coughs> fourth chapter here is the evening presentation uh, where we do kind of job sharing because sort of uh, 
as a curator, I'm you know very usually always giving lectures, so I'm giving the lecture here. Philip Barena doesn't like to give lecture; he doesn't kind of believe in that format. So whilst I give the lecture here, and um, uh, he's actually in his hotel room writing a letter to all of you, which uh, once the lecture will be over, will be photocopied and you know either tonight, later, or tomorrow morning uh, distributed. Uh, this is actually a letter. Uh, especially written for, uh, for you. And that kind of doubt about the format of the lecture is maybe an interesting starting point of <coughs> my lecture here, because it's a, a doubt I somehow share. And uh, um, the reason why I sort of think that this uh, uh, SAS-Face situation uh, is so interesting is that there's actually much more than lectures, that it is really about, um, uh, it's really about uh, very different form of conversations. And I have somehow we thought that, I mean, throughout the 20th century, the format of the exhibition has been turned around from all sides and has actually been uh, very much uh, um, uh, a, a sort of a radical experimental reality. But I see a very strange way that has not happened with the format of the lecture and the conference. And I mean, <clears throat> I've always thought that it's really um, surprising to which extent we keep to that sort of format, knowing that whenever I attend an international conference, which happens quite frequently, the, the only interesting thing really happens in the coffee break, happens in the in interstices, happens in the in-between spaces, happens once we you know, leave that space of representation and enter a sort of a more truly performative um, space. And what somehow <coughs> started to interest me around 94, 95 is how sort of experimental reality, as we do it with exhibition, how far that could be introduced to the world of lectures, conferences, symposiums. Um, and I started to work with the Academy of the Third Millennium, which is a, a school in, uh, in Munich. Uh, it has been founded by Christa Ma. It's the Burla Academy of the Third Millennium. Uh, and they've organized a series of big international conferences um, uh, where it was really about going beyond this pool, going beyond this fear of pooling knowledge. Uh, so the idea would be that artists, architects, scientists would talk to each other. And so if they each time chose a topic, the uh, most interesting one was that sort of connection between the brain and new, uh, basically neuroscience and the computer. And there was from Varela to Bruce Sterling to Carsten Hölner, a whole range of really amazing uh, participants. So the Academy of the Third Millennium asked me around 94, 95, 96, if I would not like to start to organize exhibitions, you know, see my interest in art and science and, uh, and uh, architecture and science relationship, exhibitions which could accompany these conferences, or if I would not like one to participate in these panels. And I was thinking, and was thinking that it could actually be interesting that we do a conference which would be everything but the conference. So we basically, together with Ernst Pöppel, the neuroscientist, defined a conference called Art and Brain. And it was basically a conference where everything was there but the conference. So we invited a whole set of international speakers, artists, uh, to the KFR, the biggest uh, science center in Germany, with hundreds of scientific labs. We asked the writers, the, the scientists, and I mean, we invited from Andreas Lominski to Doris Grünbein, to the Hohenbüchler sisters, um, to Douglas Gordon, a whole range of practitioners. We, we basically wanted to find out who would be the, the scientists they wanted to connect to, which are the science labs they would like to visit. Um, there was a bus for the conference participants, there were badges, there were people picking them up at the airport, there was a conference hotel, there were many, many, many coffee breaks, there was everything but the conference. And what was really interesting is that that kind of moment, which sort of injected a doubt into pro production of some sort, um, created something which has very much to do with the long-term effect. A lot of collaborations were somehow triggered, um, Carsten Höller and Rosemary Pauker started their sort of long-term collaboration. Artists and scientists started to work on books together. Very often the results you know, were only like visible two or three years later. So I started to kind of think that it could be very important every sort of few months, or at least once a year, to do such an event, which basically is a coffee break. And uh, um, ever since sort of 96, 97 we've done that, uh, sort of it has grown in time. So the, the day, actually two years ago, we did with Akiko Miyake in Kitakyushu that event called Bridge the Gap. And Bridge the Gap was somehow um, the idea of having a villa uh, an, uh, out of Kitakyushu uh, in Japan. So to do it always in a quite remote place, because that seems to be like one of the premise, so that the speakers cannot escape. Because otherwise they always sort of take many meetings and it doesn't work. And so we invited uh, um, um, I mean, architects such as Rem Kohlhaas, Stefano Bueri. We invited artists such as Marina Abramovic or uh, Pipi Dottiris. We invited uh, scientists such as Luc Steves, who runs the uh, Sony lab in Paris, uh, to basically, uh, or mathematicians like Gregory Chaitin, to spend a week in this villa out of Kitakyushu.